Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, guys. This is going to be a fun episode. I'm here in Scottsdale, Arizona at the home of my friend of Cody Nelson, the optics manager of GoHunt.com. We are fortunate to be joined by Jared Bernstein of Bernstein Outdoor Sales. Jared is the territory manager for Vortex Optics. Uh, Jared is a Marine. We've had him on the podcast before. It's always great having you, Jared. Guys, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having us, Jay. I, I love doing this. No, great to be back. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, Jared, like we talked on the last podcast, um, for those that didn't listen to that podcast, give a little bit of a background, uh, your military service, and then how that led into what you're doing now. Sure. Yeah, I did uh, did some time in the Marine Corps, uh, four years, a little less than four years, I guess, if you're counting days and seconds, but um, was fortunate to do a deployment in 2010, supporting an operation during Freedom. Um which is a good time. We did some good work, brought everybody home, which which we're thankful for. And then I uh, got in the security world, did a little bit of private security deal for executives and, and stuff like that, and then uh, decided to focus on family and started working at a local retailer here in Arizona and just met reps and met manufacturers and have just kind of been fortunate to climb the ladder a little bit in the industry. And, and now I'm in a, what I would consider a massive blessing in this position. I get to Very cool. control my destiny a little bit and work with some some really cool accounts so so with what you do now you in essence have an umbrella and you have lots of different manufacturers under that umbrella that you rep um, i do and that is something that you know you could from my perspective it opens up doors that you can go in lots of different directions uh it's interesting to see vortex is one of your main brands that you're repping right now and and working with what is it like to work with a company like vortex oh it's excellent and i'll be honest i mean <clears throat> not to downplay any of the other manufacturers i work with because i have some excellent partners but vortex makes it very they set the bar pretty high that i that i hold to these other manufacturers i mean the, just the internal team the lack of errors in our shipping department the products and the way the product team listens to the consumer it's just a it's hard to it's hard to beat it really really is have you seen, you know, a company like Vortex with the ability to take customer feedback and be able to adapt and maybe adjust and come up with new product? How does Vortex do in that category, in your opinion? Excellent. They do excellent. Um, I work with Mystery Ranch as well. They do a phenomenal job. And, and you know, sitting here with Go Hunt, Mystery Ranch, and Go Hunt are massive partners together in, in product and, and all those things. But uh, Vortex does a really good job of, of listening and uh, from all the different sides of the business, we have people that monitor the social media side and we have people within the, from the product team in the booth at the shows listening to that feedback. And then we have, you know, leaning on key accounts for feedback and, and they do, it's like I said, it's really hard to beat. It's hard to ever come up with a suggestion. It's just such a well-oiled machine. So, And Cody, from your standpoint of, of being a vendor and, and dealing with optic sales every day, uh, dealing with Vortex, and one thing that's blown me away, and I'd like you to speak a little bit sure. to it, is the massive growth that Vortex has had and the following. Um, I mean, oh, Vortex yeah. following with their customers is, it's, is you awesome. You know, we adjusted our, you know, Jared and I worked real hard and, and adjusted our SKU set that we had in the shop, and we're going to continue to do that, you know, for this coming year. And what does that mean for the well, layperson? meaning the, the product, the, the variety, you know, just the the you know what we have in our we don't. Um, carry the entire line right now um, we you know basically point things at, at at what our users tend to use and and we go outside that box a little bit in some things but um, long story short we're just trying to make it so that um, you know the 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 SKU set that we have is is what uh, is what our customers are looking for and um, you know before I got there um, I probably it was maybe a little shallow at the time and the boys were doing a great job but we, you know, Jared and I both recognized it um, and wanted to bring in a whole different uh, uh, flavor to it. Um, and so we did. And it's been, you know, Vortex over the years has been incredibly successful and it, successful. And it's, it's hard um, not to notice that. I mean, they were kind of the up and coming thing for years. And, um, they, you know, they back it up with their service. They back it up with the people at, 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 uh, in Wisconsin. And, uh, and certainly, you know, like Jared and, and, the, and the reps before Jared, um, you know, have done a phenomenal job in helping build that brand. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited about it because it um, gives us another choice. And we keep talking about choices on the podcast. And, 
and it gives us, it allows us to serve a lot of different customers. And so, um, when you have product like that and products that are good, um, it, it, it helps me sell product. And that's at the end of the day, that's what I get paid to do. Guys, before we get into the question and answer session of the podcast from some of the Instagram followers and listeners of the podcast, we've got a slew of questions here, but you both have been out uh, looking at deer and deer hunting and, you know, out in the deer woods here in Arizona. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing and what's going on out there. Um, Jared, I'll let you start. Sure. Yeah, I was fortunate to have a uh, 19A rifle tag this year that I was able to fill on on opening morning with my uh, with my good buddy Hunter Rackley. Um, I'll tell you that could give that kid a shout out. You put him behind a tripod, and half the time I don't even get glass on the tripod, and he's already oh hey Buck Buck. I'm like, <laughs> it's nice to have around. Huh? Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, he's. <laughs> I thank God for him every night, but he, uh, yeah, so he, he spotted that buck for me and, uh, and we got that done opening day, which was nice. That's a, there's a lot of tags in that unit and it wasn't a unit that I wanted to be in for Pound it out. seven days. Yeah. So it was nice to fill it on a good mature buck and, and kind of get back to work. But that was, uh, that was a good time. And there's also a, a big fire rolling in and from what I understand, day two, three, and four were pretty smoky and blown out. So oh, wow. we were thankful to get out of there on day one, but um, and then I've just been playing good friend for the over-the-counter archery stuff in Arizona now, just finding bucks and trying to help buddies and in between working and traveling and all that. So we'll be be back out this weekend probably. Probably or primarily focusing on mule deer right now over over the counter. We are. Yep. What's the rut situation? You seeing any activity? Uh, a little. I wouldn't call it full blown. Um, there's there's one good buck we've been watching. He doesn't seem to care at all. <laughs> uh, and then I have two or three other little bucks that were in his general area that, you know, you just see and keep an eye on. And they seem to be a little bit interested, but I wouldn't by any means call it crazy or totally kicked off, at least in the areas I've been. And I've been pretty close to town, um, you, know, as, you know, the December units are. I get a lot of questions on the rut and the OTC hunts and what have you. And I talk specifically a lot about the rut both for mule deer and coos deer really doesn't kick off very much until after Christmas. And, you know, already this morning I got six or eight messages from guys reporting bucks chasing does and I get it every year. And, you know, I'm not saying that bucks are not mostly smaller, immature bucks aren't going to be following and nosing around and chasing does. And certainly if there's a big buck and he happens to come in close contact with a doe, he might go over there and check her and just see what's going on. Um, and for the listeners out there, I don't want you to think that when you read something that it's just the guaranteed and it's the set in stone, like no buck will rut before Christmas. But in general, we really see bucks picking up their activity level around right. Christmas time and then on into January. So what I'm trying to do is give a sense and a feel of, yes, this time frame, mid-December, you might see some bucks nosing around certainly younger bucks it's what i witness where the younger bucks the non big bucks the non mature bucks kind of get their chance to nose around with the does first and i think it's a good sign as deer hunters whether you've got a late rifle tag or an otc archery tag to realize that you're going to get some opportunities at some younger bucks because it kind of is their chance to be with the does and kind of act like the big bucks and then it's amazing, though, when those does really start to come in, how all of a sudden maybe a buck you've never seen moves in, and all of a sudden those little bucks are pushed on the side, and they're just kind of following. Same thing when the rut winds down. You sometimes see those smaller bucks kind of come right. back in. So just for the listeners out there you know, that are seeing rutting behavior and rutting activity, I'm all for sending me reports of what you're seeing. Just understand that I'm not saying that it can't happen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that for those out there trying to plan their time of when they're going to be in the field, if they have limited time, typically if they can get there, you know, around Christmas time, you know, to the mid January standpoint or, or time frame, that's going to give them a better window of opportunity to to day in and day out chase rutting deer. Well, I think that the, The thing is, is that I think there's a lot of people that, you know, it's almost like they are trying to set their watch to it. And it's, Mm. it's not that way. It's pockety at best. And the does that are coming into estrus are coming into estrus 
because that's the time of year they come into estrus and it can differ from unit to unit and you know i think there's a lot of different factors that go into it but um what have you been seeing Cody? uh, uh, uh I, there was one pocket of deer that that i watched you know for a couple days um I, I would tell you that that it is pre-rut right now there was one group like four does and a buck um that that act acted completely ruddy um you know the buck was chasing the does and i think the thing that gave it off was as i watched those does the day before and caught them going up through a saddle and almost like, like clockwork i found them again you know a, a day and a half later and i i just watched their trail for a little while and uh i you know i gave it you know a few minutes and sure enough here comes a buck i mean right on the same exact path and uh and he you know turned out to be a, a decent buck and and uh so i watched him for a while and 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 they you know he was he was pushing him around and pushing another little you know two point off and and uh he he bedded down with him and and when they started mill around he would check him a lot and then go back and lay down and so you know he it the, it's definitely in the air right you know i wouldn't say it's you know, full blown, you know, running all over the side of the mountain, you know, and then coming back to the, it's not there yet, but it's, it's coming. You know, I got a question, um, on the Instagram about what are some of the tactics that you guys use for rutting deer? And I responded, have you listened to my podcast? There's a bunch of episodes where we talk <laughs> about that, but I thought I would take a second here and we could all kind of weigh in on rutting deer now whether we're talking mule deer or coos deer and and for this you know you could probably take this information to any state that you're in but you know if we're talking we're in arizona we're talking arizona the seasons right now are kicking off in arizona and sure. otc deer and there's a lot of which i think is great it seems like in the last year or so we arizona has gotten a lot more publicity for our otc archery deer hunts yep. a lot of the locals would be like i hate it because there's all these people coming <laughs> in from thanks go utah on. and <laughs> yeah from everywhere um you know all over the west and all all over the country to be honest um a, a couple things over the counter archery deer is still archery deer the yeah. success rate is not very good but you do have an amazing opportunity to come down if you pick your good dates to come down and see lots of rutting deer, both mule deer and coos deer. And there's not many tags across the country in the West where you can literally hunt the animal. Sure. It's talking about mule deer and coos yeah. deer right during the peak of the rut. Now you have over, to hunt. Over the counter. Yeah, over the counter. Right. You know, and then the next question is, well, do they have rifle tags? Well, no. If we had rifle tags, we wouldn't have a buck left in the state of Arizona. <laughs> but going back to tactics on rutting deer, I still think you go back to the foundation of what I like is gain optical advantage, sit down behind a good pair of binoculars on a tripod and glass them up. You, I mean, if you use that, it sounds so simple. But I still get so many messages from guys that say, oh, I need a tripod. Oh, I, you know, I have eight power binoculars. Well, that's great. But, you know, you might look at 10s. You might look at 12s. You right. might look at 15s. You might look at 18s. You know, oh, I need a spotting scope. Well, you might not need a spotting scope if you're just going to go after any buck. But if you're going to be choosy at all, you know, and want to say, oh, well, that's just a three-point buck. I'm looking for a four-point buck definitely need a spotter but if, glass them up so that's i, I yep. go back to the foundation of glass them up mm -hmm. in mule deer hunting i think in the desert a lot of times you have to understand that you have to go high and look down a lot of the mule deer are living in the desert flats right. they're living in the roly polies they're not necessarily up on the mountains whereas coos deer you go up high and look across a canyon look on you know more mountainous faces on ridges and, and what have you uh but when it comes down to hunting, rutting deer, I think one of the foundations is find does and keep track of those does and you'll eventually start finding bucks. I think you were talking how you've seen a pocket of does and all of a sudden that morning, boom, a buck showed up right yep. there. And I think that's whether you're hunting coos or you're hunting mule deer, if you can focus on the does, it sounds so simple, 
but it is pretty simple. It's focus on the does, focus where the does are at, and the bucks will show up. If you're hunting during the time periods when things are going to start escalating and does are going to start cycling and bucks are going to start coming to check them. And I I think that people miss, and, and Jay, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if, you know, Jared, I know you've seen this, and Jay, but I think it's interesting that I can see, like, what I think is the same two does like I saw the morning before or the day before or whatever it is. And if you watch those does walk and it's, and it's during the rut, I can almost assure you if, if the rut is like really on, I almost find a buck with those does at some point on that same trail. So if you find a couple of does, but why, why are they on the same trail? Well, I mean, I mean, they're they're scent, it, they're, they're scent checking, right? And they're literally, um, I, and I think that's the interesting thing is, is that now I may wander off and look at something different, but I will keep track and go back and watch those does, and and literally follow the path that they went back. Absolutely. And and inevitably, you, I, I just I can't even tell you how many times it's happened that you I, find a buck on that. Yeah, and I can't, and Jared. Excuse me, but I can't reiterate enough where you talk about watch the path that the does are on how many times i've seen a buck back trailing yeah going the wrong way yep then he turns around and realizes hey i'm going the wrong way and here he comes right back on the same trail like on a leash and guess what he goes right up the same trail right into the same thicket where the does were and he flushes them out and he starts chasing them around Mm -hmm. it's amazing how that works but unbelievable or you see the does looking back up that trail. Yeah, you know something. <laughs> something like, else is here coming. Here he comes <laughs> again, and it's having that patience of because I've I've had it happen where that doe keeps looking and she'll eat, and then she'll keep looking, and then she'll feed, then she'll keep looking, and you get you got to wait a half hour for him to show himself, but she keeps looking. She something's knows he's there. there. Exactly. Yeah. And so I mean, like I mean, I'm always hoping that sometime it's going to be a lion. I'm going to get to fill a lion tag on one right. of those. But it's you know those bucks show up, and whether it's ten minutes yeah. or fifteen minutes or a half hour, I think it's just about reading the situation. If, if mm-hmm. a doe is is you know if she's walking and feeding and very relaxed and all of a sudden she breaks that by a perfect standstill ears forward and looking in a certain direction look in that direction move uphill downhill With what, your binoculars. What, yeah whatever she's doing pay attention because it, it there a lot of times there's something coming yeah, and I think guys that are out there, if you're out there hunting now and you're finding doe groups and you're finding does with smaller, immature bucks, keep remember, you know, whether it be mark on your Onyx maps or just remember in your head where they're at. And you can leave for three or four or five days, go hunt another spot, come back and right. just check those groups of does. And as this rut progresses, you are going to find bucks that you didn't even know about with those doe groups. And that's yeah. what's so exciting to me. You know, we do our hunts in Sonora, Mexico. We hunt right during the peak of the rut with a rifle, you know, basically from the 10th of January to the 28th of January, right during the peak of the rut. And so for, you know, the last 22 years, I've gotten to hunt rutting coos deer and watch their behavior and all this stuff that you guys are talking about where, Jared, you're talking about a doe watching kind of over to the side and she keeps looking over, she keeps looking over. All of a sudden, I glass up and there's a buck bedded 30 yards that I didn't see. Yep. And if I wouldn't have been paying attention to that doe that keeps looking, here's this buck and he's bedded in the sun and I never <laughs> saw him. And then all of a sudden, he stands up and he's a giant. It's like, I mean, if you can be more aware of what the animals are telling you through what you're getting in your eye, it, it will help you as a hunter and it'll make you more successful. Yeah, I, I think the other thing too is... um patience again i i keep you know we, we've talked about this so many times it's hard to count but i watched a, a set of hunters yesterday and and look i have no idea who they are what their skill level is they had optics they had tripods the whole thing so they're they're doing their thing and i what was really interesting is i sat in the same spot for probably six hours i mean i was there before dark before light i mean before before light and I was, you know, sitting there in the dark, just enjoying a nice morning. And um, I will say that they were later. I don't know that they were late, but they were later. But at the first place that they stopped in, and I'll, you know, they were in their vehicle. And they glassed for maybe 20 or 30 minutes and then moved. 
and then glass. And, and the funnier part that I thought about the whole thing is that, you know, I kind of peeked at them once in a while, just, you know, kind of see what they were doing or whatever. And, and uh, long story short, they moved again. And every time they moved, what I thought was interesting was, is that I could see deer on the face that they're looking at. And now some of them had bucks, some of them didn't. I don't know what they were trophy hunted. So I just find it interesting that they kept, they, it, 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 I, I don't know that they saw the deer. Um, on the, on, and then they moved completely down below me, which was interesting because the hillside that they were looking at, um, virtually had no deer on it. And I, I mean, I had t- tore it apart and, you know, after 20 or 30 minutes, they, they completely left the country. And I, and I'm just going to say that like, I had a good day yesterday, but I, I just don't know if guys are, you know, we get in that. Do I wait? Do I sit? Do I stay? Do I go? Do I, you know, keep blasting or not? I just think guys get in a rush. Like, well, I think, I just think they need to be patient. I I think they need to exhaust what they're looking at first before they move. And I'm a grass is greener on the other side. Dar will tell you that. I mean, I love bouncing around, but in my mind, you have to give it 30 minutes of intense and hard looking before you move. Um, unless you're looking for a specific buck and you, you know, you, you know you've got a buck and you've got him patterned and you know he's either going to be in six or eight places and you just got to go check those places. But like I say, gain optical advantage. Right. Usually for me, that's get as high as you can um, for both mule deer and coos deer, but then you have to exhaust what you're looking at first. Sure. Once you've exhausted that and you get the sense that I need to move you have to use your gut decision to move. But how many times have you moved and you thought, gosh, I should go back where I was, <laughs> you know? And, and I don't think there's any like right way to do it. It's all, a lot of it is gut and experience from, you know, prior experiences sure. that lead you to do what you do. But in general, I don't think guys spend enough time, especially on the coos deer, um, spending enough time in one particular spot and exhausting everything in that spot. So to take it a step further, I like when Dar and I split up and go or whoever I'm hunting with, I know that if Dar's over there glassing, he's going to, he's going to thrash it. He's going to oh, look absolutely. at everything and he knows that I'm going to do that. One of the things that's frustrating when you're hunting with, with guys or hunting partners is if, you know that there could be a giant buck right there in front of them, but they're going to look for 15 minutes and move on. That's not a good trait to have as a hunting partner. You want to have someone that yeah. you know if, if Jared's over there that he's going to pound it, well, there is. pound there's, it out before he's going to move and be impatient because there, you have to exhaust what's in front of you. There's a trust that develops, right? All right. And you're thinking, yeah, I hope that guy's got my back over there. Yeah. I mean, we've come to all the, you know, the trouble to get here. I hope, right. hope somebody's holding up their end of the deal. And, you know, generally speaking, guys do, but, you know, we it's, all miss them once in a while. It's one of those self-correcting deals, though, isn't it? And eventually you, you know, you get a guy, you go sit on a hilltop and you give it 20 minutes and you move. And then one of your another buddies who's not on that trip tells you they went up there and found the biggest buck they've ever seen. You go, well, I sat on it the day before. Right. And it's like, was he there? Was he not? And then, of course, you do the sleepless night deal. And then the next time you convince yourself, okay, I'm ready to move at 20 minutes. I'm going to give it till 40 and then I'll move. Right. And it's a, you know, that I happened, usually, it's happened to me. Yeah. I usually, when I'm sitting there, I just, I'm fighting the urge to move. I usually say, I'm going to give it well, another 15 minutes. I'm going to hit it over again. And I try and be disciplined and I always try and give it another 15, mm-hmm. you know, glass for 30 minutes or an hour for sure. I'm going to give it another 15 okay, maybe I'm going to move over to another knob, hit some different country. Maybe I need to go back, just check it, make sure I didn't miss anything. Because you know as well as I do, mule deer and coos deer, especially in these colder temperatures in these months when they're rutting, sometimes they're just in a period where they're going to be laying down and they're not going to be up and not going to be visible. And you can pop back up over there and boom, there they are, right there in the same spot. But it also goes to, like, Jay, those does that, that I saw, you know, a couple days ago and then saw them again yesterday, they were through a saddle on an opposing face. And and I looked at that, you know, like it was one of those places just because of the way the sun comes up, the sun hit it first. 
And I literally was like, okay, I'll hit that, but I'm going to come back. And I, and cause there was other places that I, I definitely wanted to hit. And as soon as the, the, you know, I kind of exhausted what I was doing. I went back and stared at that little V and, and, and at that face. And if I hadn't just paused and just given my eyes a moment just to take in what I was looking at, relax, settle in and, and give it like, I think I gave it 10 or 15 minutes. And it was, it was just, it was a little piece of dirt just across the deal. And sure enough, there was, there, there was the toes that moved across it. If I hadn't have done that, it wouldn't, it, it just wouldn't have happened. Never seen yeah. them. So guys, I want to move patience. on to some of the questions that we have here from the listeners uh, and the podcast, or excuse me, the Instagram followers. Uh, for, for those of you listening that don't follow me on Instagram, I encourage you to do so. Uh, at J Scott Outdoors, uh, it seems like two or three times a week I'm doing a Q&A, uh, answering questions from you guys. So if you haven't uh, interacted with me, uh, feel free to do that. I love the questions. You can also email them to me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. Uh, guys, let's just dive right into some of the questions here. Uh, is Vortex planning on releasing a 15 by 56 UHD in the near future? If not, uh, why is Vortex killing the 15s? Question mark. Before you go into that, guys, I do want to say that I had a chance to, my friend Phil Kramer, Kramer Hunts, uh, spent a bunch of time with me on this in, in this last sheep season, and I did get a chance to spend quite a bit of time looking through his 18 uh, UHDs. And nice I was piece. actually very, very impressed with... Nice piece. The word that comes to mind is like vivid, like the coloration. I don't know how to explain it, but it was almost, it, it was like, a, it was real vivid. Everything that looked like, I mean, I was really impressed with the way that they looked. Awesome. Um, to my eye. And he's been really happy with them. Uh, so I just wanted to add that, that I got a good chance to really look around with them and, and was impressed. Um planning on releasing the 15 by 56 UHDs? So I, I can't say that I know of a plan. I will say that we do hear that quite often. Uh, it comes up, I wouldn't say it comes up as often as, as a couple other things, but it does, it does come up quite often. Um, in an industry that, you know, and this is my personal take, this isn't, I'm certainly not speaking for the company on this deal, but um, in an industry that's very, I hate to say copycat because everyone has their, their different flavor on things, but there's a, there's almost a set standard, right? And if you go back to looking at rifle scopes from the eighties and, and it took a long time to convince some of those old timers that there was another option besides a three to nine. And so I'm, I'm not by no means saying right. that the 15 is dead and the 18 is going to kill. It's not at all my implication, but at some point a company has to take a little bit of a, a leap of faith, do something a little bit different, try to provide a little bit of a different result and maybe hit a little bit of a different category. And we hit on this when we were doing the UHD release podcast, we talked about how I personally don't do well behind a single tube, but my spotting scope timeline is very short. And so 18s for me fill a gap. And even before the podcast, we talked about the, the stuff I have going on with my eyes and the eye doctor appointment later. So I'm a uni I may be a unique animal, but I exist. And so the 18 for me fits that long-term sit. And then again, if I want to count points or I want to check something, then of course my, my spotter comes out and that's great. But I think that, uh, I think that Vortex took a pretty neat leap of faith on that and it's been extremely well received. And, and I think that's exactly what's happened because the people that are calling and buying them Quite frankly, I mean, th there are people that, that, you know, really don't like looking through spotting scopes. They're, they're looking for that extra power, which, I mean, that certainly fits that bill. I mean, and I mean, I took them out yesterday and, and had fun with them, and, and they, I mean, they do, they do great. So I think they're an awesome piece of glass. I, I just wonder if Vortex did do a 15. Sorry to interrupt. But if they did do a 15, now they'd have the 15 and the 18s would the same guy that buy the 18 buy the 15 or would they be eating their 18, They'd you be, know, so it, it's, I think I, it's hard to I, say. And, and yeah. I guess that we, I think we talked about this last time too. Look, they had an, a 15 and a 20. And I think at a certain point in time, they had to kind of make a decision. Well, are we going to keep both or um, I, I just, 
I mean, I see, you know, why you'd quote unquote split the difference. And I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some manufacturer, you know, issues or, you know, I don't mean issues, but I mean the fact that they said, you know what, you know, we, you know, we can't do both. You know, can we compromise on doing this? And I mean, what, ha- what happened with that? I, I don't know. But well, and I'm totally speculating too, from a Vortex standpoint, I, mean, I could see how they say, Hey, there's already a bunch of manufacturers out there with these 15s. We already have a pair of 15s. We want to do something a little bit new, right? Sure. And we want to throw the 18s out to the marketplace. And I think the market has spoken because yeah. it's hard to keep the 18s in stock. Sh- shake the, it up the a little, market's right? spoken that there's a need for an 18 mm-hmm. out there. Well, how many how many AR15 companies are there? How many bolt gun companies are there, right? Right. Um, you know, I, I work with Nosler. They're doing a bunch of lightweight gun stuff. Well, Weatherby just put out an extremely lightweight gun. So inevitably, Nosler and Remington, everybody is going to have to have a response to the fact that that company now took and innovated and moved a little further. Everybody makes a 16-inch 5.56. Well, then what do you do to, to make that, you know, where's the appeal? Um, so I think that I think that the 18 was an awesome move. And, and like you hit on and Cody can elaborate even further, the back order list is significant. Mm-hmm. So cl- clearly it's working. Um, obviously, we're, we're doing our best to keep up with that, and it's certainly getting better. But there is uh, – we're certainly shipping them out faster. Yeah, than no, I mean them, so. the, the sales have been very strong with them, and and uh, and I think it's it's warranted. It's good. It's a good product. Period. Next question is Kaibab 18s or Razor UHD 18s, mainly hunting in New Mexico, but taking a Mexico trip for deer soon. Uh, so there's obviously a, a very significant price difference between those two units. So that's all, that's always a factor. Budget's always a factor. Like Cody always says, buy the best glass you can afford, put it on a tripod and slow down that, that applies to those. And they are different. They are different units. Um, Again, I try not to give you too much no, credit. No, no, that's know, it. Every it's kind of been, it's kind of been, I, I was going to say, it's it made true. me feel it's good. Sad. I was just like, man, like somebody, yeah. uh, one person listened to it. I, I, I thought that was pretty good. I, I try, try not to listen too His often, but I did. Yeah. Yeah, it feels, but those two, yeah. those two are different price points. But what you will find between those two units, price point aside, is the eye cups are very different. Yep. And so the Kaibab eye cups are a little bit thicker, and some people simply cannot get a good edge-to-edge image through them. It's an excellent quality binocular. They have a, a for what they are. The weight is right. The size is right. Um, I, I think, but they have those eye cups mess with with people more than the razor sharp eye cup of the UHD. For that, for that person, I think comparing those two, I can't tell you two pieces of glass more to get your eyes behind to see what difference they make, yep. if at all possible, yep. for that person to get his eyes behind them because of the eye cups. And then the Abiconic Prism will it, it it will change what he's going to see. So um, I think that person should really try to put his eyes behind him and, and and make a decision. And for and for that listener again, I encourage you to have the salesman or the retail location, whatever it is, take you outside looking at something of that quality in any manufacturer. I don't care whose name's on it. Yep. Looking at it under incandescent light inside of a Cabela's or inside of a Sportsman's or inside of wherever is not going to get it done for it you. Will, it, yeah, I would it, highly encourage getting it outside. It will distort room. the color. It, just, it doesn't do anybody's product yeah. any good. That lighting is horrible. Next question. Vortex UHD compared to Zeiss, what are your selling points? What, which Zeiss are we... I'm assuming does he list a wait, 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 Zeiss, it, Vortex UHD compared to Zeiss dot dot dot. What are your selling points? I mean, I, I mean, I can I can tell you that just hit the, the from hit a the UHD brand, from selling a, points from a brand standpoint. Um, without knowing what Zeiss product we're talking about, um, obviously the VIP warranty is a massive selling point in that question. When you're going to start spending that kind of money on any product, whether it be electronic or binocular or a car part, having an unlimited and an unconditional lifetime warranty is a big deal. So that's going to obviously set us apart. But using that Abiconic Prism for us in the UHDs has has produced superior optics. And so we're, we've just been... Yeah, I, I think it. to elaborate on what that guy, I think there's an important... Let's just assume maybe he's talking about 18s and 15s. Back on this conversation, mm-hmm. um, I think the glass on both of them is excellent. And me being, I, I prefer the 15s. I want a little bit wider field of view. I'll take the 15s in that sense just from a, a, a I just want the wider field of view. 
and that's that that's what I would go on. Um, but I I mean really the both the glass and ac- both of them are excellent. And I find so, even too, and I hunt I mean, with guys that use the Zeiss fifteens. That's a, even got a little bit of a thicker eye cup too, which for some people works excellent, yep. and for some people it doesn't. Just like you know, diesel versus gas engines, you got to figure out what you're doing with it, and then take your anatomy and plug that into the equation, and and run with what works best for you. Um, but we are finding that they did take that suggestion from the Kaibab, those thicker cups, and, and then, then when we did them, the UHD, they the, they took the, that to yeah, heart, and it, exactly. it has definitely paid off. Got a question here. Will they come out with straight offset razor spotting scopes so we can dual mount? Um, st- wait a minute. Straight offset and a dual mount. Yeah. So he's talking about the fact that the the razors are dead don't, straight. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're straight as an arrow mm-hmm. and step down from the the objective. So actually, yeah, you can't. You can't put them together. That would um, be hard, yeah. Even with the 65s, I, you're probably still... I can... I'd have it to all try comes to the well, of your eye. I mean, like, here's the thing. I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but unless Vortex is... I would love it if Vortex would come out with a, you know, 22 to 25 by 60 or 65 or some combination of... That would be really cool for them to do that. Me personally, I don't think you're ever going to see that in the spot in scope to to specifically for duels. That they're I think I it's a limited market. Dual yeah. mounting spotting scopes just, is a limited they're market. Not do that. There's obviously a competitor of Vortex that produces a two eye solution that's phenomenal. Um, I, I don't I I can't say that I've ever heard that in a in any form of product development talk. But again, no. staying in my swim lane, I'm certainly not included in those all that often. Thoughts on Diamondback Tactical for cheap, decent option for AR for planking coyotes. <coughs> Excellent. This is yeah, right why, up your yeah, wheelhouse. Excellent. I would say we're why selling, not? We're selling yeah, a pile I mean, up absolutely. for that reason. Um, you know, the Diamondback Tactical is a neat scope. You're getting into a 30-millimeter <coughs> tube, so you have uh, quite a bit of travel internally. That reticle has quite a bit of travel built in as well, or not travel, but but um, usability and uh, that scope also being a first focal plane, you, you then gain, as long as you understand how to use that, you gain all of the benefits of that with holdovers at any power and the ranging capability and all that. So, um, that's an excellent scope, especially yeah. for coyote hunting. It's, it's phenomenal for, for moving targets. It's phenomenal for reading wind and, and, uh, in a, in a yeah, it's, it, mid it, to it, entry level scope, it does. It, I mean, and I would tell you that the scope, even in the, that, that same scope in the, uh, uh, 4 to 16, 6 to 24 has mm-hmm. been a good seller for us too. What would be the next step up that you guys would say for that same application of Coyote planking? Vipers. The, yeah, the Viper, the Viper HS and HST series. Um, now, there's not a 4 to 16 first focal plane HS or right. HST. Those are all seconds. There is a HSLR, and that's a 6 to 24 that's first focal plane, and we see a ton of guys use that for – more long range type coyote hunting, predator hunting, and a whole lot of uh, prairie dog hunting. So we see guys using those quite a bit up there, Wyoming and Montana, and shooting prairie dogs at at a grand. And and we've also, uh, you know, I we, you know we've sold a bunch of the one to six Viper HSs to the. Uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the PST. PSTs. Sorry, my, my bad, my PST to the uh, um, to a local uh, law enforcement mm-hmm. that have worked out real good for that close stuff too so and i i mean I'll, truth be told my coyote rifle has a one to six razor on it i i, I like that that low power i see everything that's going on yep. and if you slow down and again taking the optics deal to the rifle if you have the right rifle mount for your tripod and just take your time i mean i we do work with the one to sixes i think people are way i mean we've gotten in i i think that they would be really surprised on what you can do with a six power you know, in an AR or even a four power in an AR, and and I, because we we've we've been so over like power, like everyone's got to be four to sixteen, more or power, more six better, to 20, yeah. yeah, and and uh, you know, I just think back to the day. My first rifle was an Ot six with a with a with a four a K four Weaver on it, and I mean, you you know, if you practice with it, you can actually do pretty amazing things with it. 
You can, but so, it's not but to discourage no. from, from power and, and more power, being able to see things. I mean, there's certainly times where I've cranked the scope up and saw something that I did not know was there. Yep. I and mean, there, there's definitely an argument for both sides of it. But Can you, in layman's terms, explain focal plane? Sure. So there's two, there's two uh, major designations there. There's first focal plane and second focal plane. Um, second focal plane, the, the quickest way to tell what you're looking at as far as those scopes go is to pick it up and work through the magnification ring. And if the reticle grows and shrinks, you have a first focal plane scope. And if the reticle does not move, but the image grows and shrinks, you have a second focal plane scope. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, an advantage to second focal plane is the reticle is always the same size. So every time you get behind that gun and look through that scope, you're looking at the exact same size reticle. So you're, you're very familiar. Um, and second focal plane can be used to range. It can obviously be used for holdovers, but the lines, the subtensions, all of the markings and hash marks in there, they are, there's, there's distance to them. We tell you that the distance between the center and the first line is X and you find that in the owner's manual. Those distances are only what we tell you at a specific power. And typically on those, it's a, at max power, full power, unless otherwise designated. Um, on a first focal plane scope, the reticle is, is growing and shrinking. Those lines are adjusting, and so those lines are equal or of value at all magnifications. So that can be a great thing if you're using it to range. Um, you can use your reticle to range. There's a formula. Um, that can be great if you're using it for a holdover or you're using it to compensate right. for wind, right? Um, a downfall to first focal plane would be that at lower power, the reticles are very small and nearly translucent on certain scopes. So if you have something like a 6 to 24 first focal plane and you're coyote hunting and you always get that crazy drunk coyote cousin that pops out at 12 yards and you crank that thing down to 6 power, you may have a hard time finding center. You, you could, and it's not a, a all the way across the board deal. It's just, again, your anatomy interfacing with that small reticle can be difficult mm -hmm. or strenuous. Um, so they both have their, they both have their place in the world. I love second focal plane scopes when I'm hunting with kids. I never have to worry about them finding the reticle. Right. There's always a clear center point. We work the turrets, you dial, it's fine. Um, it just depends on what you're doing with them. It's a, it's really a, an education deal and a user preference. Got a statement here from a guy saying great vortex has a great warranty. Kids misplaced my uni adapter mount and they sent me a new base. Well, that's, that's even obviously above and beyond the scope of what we typically will call the warranty. But that, that's the kind of company the Vortex is. You call with a, with a no nonsense, no crazy, you know, my wife got mad and threw it. Yeah, no, she probably didn't, pal. You lost it. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're honest, most of the time they just, they're just normal, excellent people to work with. It's not a huge, not a huge deal. You sound like you've heard that before, Jared. <laughs> the stuff that I've, I've never heard. heard that before. Oh. My wife threw it at me, and it landed in the back of the truck, and I didn't know, and I hit a speed bump, and I, no, you probably just lost, lost it, it, bud. It's okay. There's a question here. Any chance for a Vortex equivalent of the Swaro BTX in the near future? Yeah, again. What? I, I keep, I you know, know choices. I lo I love choices. My answer to that is I would bet that they're probably going to do it sometime in the future, but I have no idea. I truly don't either, Jay, and, and it's another one I would call that up there with the 15 question. It definitely comes up. I was just at a retailer this weekend doing a two-day event, and it came up. Um, I certainly don't hear it every hour of every day, but it definitely it definitely if, roars its If head. there's a company to do a – and what I would – you know, you've got companies like Doctor that makes a 40 by 80 or a 30 by 80, or you've got Koa that does a – uh, a 32 by 82. If there's a company out there that's going to produce something, I'll call it between the, the, the binoculars I just mentioned and then the old 20 by 60 stabilized ice. If there's a company to do that out there, I think it's probably Vortex to give us something like a, a 25 by 60 or 65. You know, and for anybody range. listening, make it straight. <laughs> our, our product development guys do a heck of a job and when they go out and they put on the whiteboard this is the target we're going after they hit it yeah so if if they're working on it and i truthfully do not know if they're working on it they're not going to put it out until it hits exactly what they're trying to hit right until it's done right and and that's something that vortex has always done and i believe will continue to do well 
Next question, 15 by 56 slash 18 by 56, are they actually reasonable for all use binos or of a pack and spotter? Uh, or excuse me, or more of a pack and spotter. I would I would call it more of a tripod solution. Eight, 18s and even 15s freehanding to me is a very difficult solution unless you can anchor and even anchor in your elbows or any of that other. I mean, to me, 12s are about the peak of handheld binoculars and everything else goes on a tripod. Yeah, I, I just I would not classify them as an all around use. Um. I, I I would still try to use an 8 and an 18 or 8 and a 15 or a 10 and 15 or 10 and an 8, you know, of some sort before mm -hmm. I... Um, but, yeah, I mean, I could see people using them as a pack and spotter. If, I, mean, I think if, if you were just, going after buying one unit, and I think we've all had this conversation at this very table, if you were going after one unit and it was the only one you could buy, it would be 1250 If you were a Western hunter and needed a solution for a tripod and for a... Yeah, um, when will a 12 power fury be out? Yeah, another, that's another one that it, it certainly has been talked about. I don't know if a 12 power fury is even on the radar. Um, you know, th that's a very Western hunting specific question, right? And, and Vortex does a pretty good job of hitting the whole market. And so when you start looking at, yes, Western hunting is extremely important, but what percentage of. The overall really business small. applies to Western hunting. What percentage applies to international? What percentage applies to hunting Western Pennsylvania, right? You start getting all of those groups together, and we're not a, a solely Western hunting brand, and so there's a whole lot of products on the table. Well, and There's uh, what? There's only one, like a Geovid R, is the only 50 or, you know, plus 10 power I know of. Right, uh, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, there might be some off-brand that I'm not even aware of that does a, a range fine. But I, I, I yeah, I, th I think it's the geo like a geo vid ours. The Zeiss 1556, right? The Zeiss is a 10. The Zeiss is a 1054. The is a 10. Loopholds 10. Yep. Four, I mean, yeah, they're all 10s or eights. What's the importance of adjusting parallax in rifle scopes? So parallax is not the optical phenomenon between your eye and the reticle and the target. And when they're not on the same plane, you can get distortion. And so parallax compensates and fixes that equation um, at extreme distance or even at moderate distance. Parallax can essentially you're aiming and shooting at something that you're not actually looking at. You're, it's kind of the, like the, the images. I always like to say it's almost as if the, not correct. the, the crosshairs are bending shifted and, bent, there, exactly. if, and basically it, it amounts to if you are perfectly behind the scope and in line and everything is what it's supposed to be you really shouldn't i guess experience Parall no I mean, because it, the, the parallax there, there's got to be a relationship scope. between that though yeah i mean I, it's in the scope but and i tell people look you you know and on the side of the scopes you'll see yardages on a parallax knob. Right. And keep in mind that those are engineered. It's a very broad to put that number on. There's very broad. So don't get hung up on, Oh, I range the deer. He's at 350. I need to put it directly in between the 300 and 400 on my parallax knob. Just run that knob. I would start at 300. If that deer ranges at 350, I'd start at 300 and I would move that parallax knob slowly, not even paying attention to what the numbers say until everything is crisp. A reticle's crisp. Agreed. The deer is crisp. If the deer's got two heads, you're either really lucky or something's wrong. <laughs> And if you have two reticles, something is definitely wrong. And you need to you need to just run that parallax knob, run it real slow. And as soon as it's crisp, then start your breathing sequence and go to work. Yeah. But it's definitely, I mean, it's, uh, it's extremely important. Extremely, extremely important. Yeah. It, it, especially at the longest ranges. Right. Right. I will say that we probably got six or eight questions asking about a BTX comparable from Vortex. I think it needs to be noted, but we've already answered that. I believe it. I think we, I can tell you that I got six to eight, maybe 10. Uh, when are the 15 power UHD razors going to be released? So I think that's noted if anybody from Vortex is listening. I think to not, to just list it as one question. So those are two that a bunch of people are asking about. It's, it's excellent data. And I, and I summarize when we do these, Jay, I, I go back and summarize and, and send it to the right people and make sure that everyone's in the loop on kind of what 
the consumers is after and what they're thirsty to know. And uh, that's all extremely important data. Yeah. That's Here's another question. How are the Razer UHD 1250s to handhold? You were just kind of talking about that range when it gets to 12 power, you're kind of right there where personally on 12 power, um, I, my hands have a little bit of shake to them. I always have, I can't, I mean, I can pull them up and look at something at 200 yards and kind of go, okay, but to do it very much or to, to do it a lot, mm -hmm. hand holding 12s for me is tough. I can handhold tens and under. So eights and tens pretty much I use tens on my chest. Um, curious what you guys' thoughts on the 1250 well, razors are. I, I think it's the, the, the upper end of, of hand holding. Um, there is typically, uh, uh, the fact that I like that most of the 1250s are typically a little bit heavier than their, than their 10, you know, cousin, if you will. And so I think that sometimes when you have a little bit heavier glass, you know, you can handhold it a little bit steadier, um, to some degree, um, I certainly can hold 12s way easier than I can than I can a a 1556. Absolutely. With, I mean without it's without question. So uh, yeah, I mean I, I there are some people that are 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 switching to 1250s and using them as a chess class and I think that that's um you know again I think that there are things that you can do. I think that you can put your thumbs in between your chest harness and you can get, kind of use it as resistance. Um, I like to balance my bow off the back of my shoulder and my hand over the limb and holding on to it to help give it a little bit of weight balance. Um, I've also held my rifle like through the, uh, the, the rifle sling on my thumb and then grab onto the glass and just kind of pick the rifle up off my, just a little bit to, to help steady it. But I do that with eights or tens anyway. Well, stability is a beautiful thing and, and exactly. more points of contact. I mean, there's a reason exactly. that tripods have three legs. Yep. It's, you know, that's a... Stability. So, yeah, I, I think that you can do it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they're fine as long as a guy... But I... Yeah, it, it would not be my first choice as a handheld glass, but a guy can certainly do it. Well, I forced myself last year to carry 12s on my chest just from a, an educational standpoint. And I, I went back to 10s this year out of personal preference but there is like you said you know i mean just between what you said and what cody just got done saying there's a difference there's anatomy involved in what glass looks better there's there's anatomy involved in what works better for you from a functionality standpoint it's not a anybody that's you know has a marketing campaign of this is the end all be all is, is smoke and mirrors there you have to pay attention to what that consumer needs for the guy out there that is looking at vortex and they're wanting to know from a chest binocular to a, in the pack on a tripod binocular and a spotter, you know, what, what would you recommend to say an Arizona coos deer hunter? What would be your three, your chest, your pack, and your spotter for that coos deer hunter or say high country mule deer hunter where glassing is a premium? So I'll, I'll say two different gear lists for those two guys. We'll start with the mule deer hunter. Um, I would do UHD 10 by 42s on my chest, the 18s in my pack, and a Razor 85, whether it be straight or angled based on personal preference, um, somewhere at my, at my uh, disposal. From a coos deer standpoint, or excuse me, from a high country standpoint, um, let me back up. I mixed those up. That was what I meant for coos deer. Okay, from a from a high country standpoint where there's a lot of hiking and packing involved and, and there may be ultra light capability that could be nice, the Razer HD 10x42 on the chest is a really nice, lighter weight, smaller, more compact unit. So UHDs all across the board for, for anything that I have less than a 10 mile hike or maybe access to a side by side or the truck or whatever it is. But if I'm packing or hiking somewhere, I like the Razer HD. Uh, on my chest from a uh, from a weight standpoint, but I'm still taking my 18s in my pack and or swapping the 18s and just taking a spotter. Kind of depends on again for me. I don't look through a spotter for a long time very well, so I would if I was worried about weight, I would take 18s, leave the spotter, and put tens on my chest. Okay. Hope that wasn't too convoluted. Cody, do you have any? Yeah, I, you know it's funny. Uh, yesterday I was in a place where you could glass, I don't know, three miles and 200 yards. So I I. I, 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 most of the time I had my eight sitting right by my, 
my my leg and being able just to look over my shoulder to the left and I would pick up my 15s and, and look at a couple different places with those and then you know for the most part I would use either the BTX and, and you know yesterday was kind of an oddball day because my pack was just completely loaded I mean to the hilt with optics yesterday but I, I, I like the 8, 15 and spotter combination that's my favorite um, if I was going to pack and I, you know, it was going to ultimately try to save weight. Um, I would get, I know people, people might have to sit down cause I, <laughs> I, I will use my, my Leica or, um, my 2400R as my range finder, as my, as my chest glass and use my 15s and a spotter. That's, I, I would get rid of my 10s before I got rid of my 15s or spotter and this is like we're talking about hunting coos deer around here and doing mm-hmm. that. That's that's me. I've done that before. I can see plenty with that seven power. And and if if it's any more that I need to pay attention to, I get my tripod out and put the 15s on it and, and try to figure out what it is. Got a question here. Talk about the various um, standalone range finders that Vortex offers. Sure. So we have kind of a, and Vortex does a great job of this in most of the products they offer is, you know, there's a wide variety of, of availability. So it starts with our impact. Uh, that's yep. an 850 yard range finder. They sit on the shelf at 199 bucks. Um, it's not illuminated. So it has a black display, which when you start thinking about it, you start, well, I, I might want it to light up red. Um, I'll be honest, I've gone out and used it and I can't find its limitation. I've never one time using it been like, Oh, I wish it lit up. But there is there is something to be said for for that red display. Uh, the nice thing about the non-illuminated is you're not adjusting the brightness as much. You just kind of center to center, and there's, that's what we run with. But it is an 850-yard unit on a reflective target, so that gives you a limitation on an animal, right? Typically, most rangefinders are about half. So whatever the whatever the manufacturer calls it out at, 850 on a non-reflective surface, deer, elk, sweatshirt, right? you're going to get half of that 850 typically, maybe a little more if you're steady or on a tripod, but general rule. Um, then we have our Ranger 1800. That one on the shelf is another hundred bucks. Um, that one is illuminated. It goes out to 18, 1800 yards. Now we're getting into more of that, so that rifle nice. hunter or, or what, you know, that deal, that particular unit is also threaded. We'll go right on a tripod, um, has a belt clip. So again, nice, nice user, um, usability yeah. there so and then we step up to the the ranger or excuse me the razor 4000 which uh, i believe you've been you've been working yeah, with in the field a little a bit and i've been hunting all year with pretty sweet little rig so that's a that's an extremely capable unit it has then even more features built in with the last mode and the first mode and elr and all those things are detailed out in the user user manual but um that thing is lightning fast yes, and you can freehand I mean, I've had readings. I've had readings freehanding out the twenty five hundred on rocks. I mean, it's just a. It's I was shocked at how unit. fast it is, and I was shocked at how, I mean, literally how far you could get readings. I mean, I was getting stuff in that two thousand yep. yard range. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't, yeah, two thousand for a handheld is inc- that's awesome. Oh, it's yeah, you're, it's incredible. You're past a mile. And, you know, and for the users. for people listening, like they're saying, why do you need to? read something at 2,000 yards, but if you can say, okay, I'm going to range that hill and I'm going to range the animal, you can do some subtraction, you know, whatever, you can yeah. kind of calculate, okay, I need to get to that point. So, mm-hmm. you know, most of the time ranging an animal at five or 600 yards is about all you're going to need for most applications, but the ability to hit ranges, you know, 1,500, 1,000, 2,000 yards gives you the ability to kind of plan how you're going to set up and maybe approach right. that animal for a shot. It's, it's awesome. Well, from a guiding standpoint, and I'm sure you run into, you get a client and you say, okay, well, how, how far are you good out to? Well, I have, I have data to 400. Well, perfect. So if you're two miles where Cody's looking yesterday and you say, well, what hill do I need to be on for this exactly. client to successfully make a shot or to feel comfortable? You know, if, if 400 is his threshold, you and I know I'm trying to get that person to 250, right? right? Like, I right. want everything in that person's favor so when they lay down, they're happy. Right, right. I volunteer to do youth hunts with, with different organizations. And we get a child that 
we know can shoot out. You know, dad shows up and says he's good to 250. Perfect. Like, my goal is for that child to be at 150 at a max, right? So you, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. And I stand at retailers and do events, and they say, well, I'll never need 4,000. And then they, you bring that simple fact up from a planning stage, and they go, you know, I never thought of that. That's pretty cool. And then, you know, Visa cards start getting swiped. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a really neat yeah, it's, tool. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you can – you know, range that hill and figure out, okay, well, that'll get me halfway there. Then where I, you know, when I get there, I'll figure the other part out. I used it in 19A, the last week of October, to find the unit boundary. I was on the top end of 19A, right by the Verde, couldn't see the Verde, couldn't figure out exactly where the Verde was. And we used it with, in conjunction with all next to say, okay, well, that hill's actually not in the unit and we thought it was. And so you can, you know, yeah, and I would, I would have hiked over there and looked at my map and been like, oh, wow, I'm not in the unit. This isn't good, you know. Right. So it's it's a pretty neat if you if you have access to it, it's a pretty neat tool to you start kind of finding ways to use it. Question here, what variable optic for southern Arizona coos deer? That's a pretty open ended question. As far as rif- rifle scope and guessing? Said, uh, well, I he see, doesn't I, specify, he says what variable optic. So I'm gonna assume that he's talking about binos and then I'm gonna assume let's go ahead and throw it into rifle scopes since it would round out the discussion. Yeah, I mean, variable to me would be either spot or rifle scope. Cause you yeah, I mean, the ver- the sp- well, I don't know. Okay, so he's if he's it. saying, like, bi- well, let's start with bino. Well, yeah, yeah if yeah, we're yeah. going bino, and like for coos deer, I, I, I would probably choose the the ten forty two, um, razor. Uh, uh, razor HDs. I take the the because of their their lightweight and small. I take the the eighteen fifty six uh, UHD. UHDs. And I'd throw a spotter in there, and we'd be good to go. I, I, I think the, that that would be my, you know, and for a rangefinder, I, I mean, I'm, I don't have the field experience with the 4,000 yet, but um, by all accounts, I, I love the unit, and I would go with the, the 1,800 on that deal. You know, if we're, if we're, you know, if we're going along that, that's what I do. Yeah, I think I would take the Razor 4,000 simply from a planning stage. Those coos are, you guys are looking so far down there why not have it doesn't you, weigh that much more and you're getting twice the readout right with you know and you're getting one one extra x so it's a seven power unit instead of a six coos deer are x percent smaller than you know you anything working in your favor with those little guys i think is yeah. a beautiful thing from the spotter standpoint i think i'd have the 85 from our line um the biggest brightest deal we can get is going to help in looking for those little guys so. and then let's talk about rifle scopes for that cooster hunter sure well well depending on what he's trying to do i like the uh the, the what is it the razor fifth uh, three to fifteen yep the lightweight hunter uh, the lightweight hunter yep um you know d- again depending on the caliber and everything he's trying to do i mean i think that's a i think that's a very uh i would say um kind of do everything across the planet kind of a scope the light the lightweight hunter is an excellent scope and a lot of people overlook it because it's a one inch tube but i'll tell you the the one and only bull that i've shot with that one inch tube rifle scope was at 784 yards yeah, incredibly capable uh, it's there's a there's a ton of elevation within the reticle um and then there's a bunch of adjustment obviously within the turret you know it, it again that that depends on the shooter the capability of the round the rifle there's so many things when you say well what's a rifle scope for coos deer that's a really hard deal because i if it was up to me i'd hunt coos deer with a lever gun just to say i did it but is that realistic probably not you know so it's i think the other one that we, other we sell a lot gear. of anyway is the that that i would certainly put in there would be a um, the, the four to 16, um, you know, with a BDC, that's fairly popular. I mean, they can do, yeah, they can do either or, or they can run a turret on it as well. Here's the deal guys. If you get a rifle scope and I just encourage people don't bounce around rifle scope, the rifle scope, the rifle scope, get a rifle scope and learn it and maximize its capability based on the feature set it has. If it has cap turrets, such cap turrets for a reason. Learn how to use that reticle. If it has a windage-related reticle and the field filmed in the bottom that will show you how to read wind or show you how to call a miss, take that manual, look online, take a class, go to a school and learn how to actually use that rifle scope in conjunction with that rifle. Pay attention to the ammo you buy. Stay within the same caliber, the same weight, the same lot if you can, and anything you can do to be consistent and when you lay down behind that gun and you know the reticle and you know that rifle and you know your ammo you're taking all of those things all of that unknown out of the equation and you're setting yourself up for that much more well, success. we have guys do it all the time that buy you know two of the same scope 
for I two love different that. I love that. Person. And I think because they're just trying to be yeah. as methodical and keep everything the same as they can, which I think it's. I think that's. I, there's not. I don't know that there's a better piece of advice out there. Nope. Um, you know, take take but, as much of the unknown out. I mean, how many times have you? How many shots have you made from a tripod in the rain? How many shots have you made from a tripod when it's sunny out or looking into the sun or looking south? There's all these unknowns. There's all kinds of stuff working against you in this hunting deal, this addiction we all have. You take a couple things out of that equation, you lessen that stress a little bit, and then you gain yep. the ability to make I a good shot. could not agree more. Guys, this has been awesome getting to bounce some stuff off you and have you guys answer some questions. I want to give you guys a chance to kind of have some concluding thoughts here. Uh, before we do that, I want to let you guys know the listeners, um, you can call and reach Cody to talk to him about glassing, uh, to talk to him about optics, optic sales. If you're looking to purchase any binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, tripods, anything to do with binoculars, anything to do with optics, give Cody a call 702-847-8747. That's ex extension two. You can also send him an email at optics at gohunt.com. Cody, I want to read something here, uh, and I get these every day. Hey, Jay, just letting you know that Cody took care, uh, excellent care of another one of your listeners. Quick response to emails, followed up with a 15-minute phone call where he answered all of my questions and provided expert opinion. Fantastic prices on everything. My new uh, binoculars and head showed up within a couple of days, and the, and the back-ordered tripod showed up yesterday. Earlier than expected, I'll be calling him next week to thank him and get a little more advice on setup. Thanks for all the teaching. Keep up the good work. I mean, nice. Cody, I get these every day. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. It's it's awesome to help people, and I, I really do. I work very hard, and probably my wife maybe sometimes wants to shoot me. Um, I try to be very diligent, uh, diligent about um, returning messages and in answering emails and getting back to keep people quick. Um, I, I respect their time. I respect the fact that they want to do things, you know, quickly and maybe they have a hunt coming up or Christmas or whatever. Um, but I, I would tell you this, if, if for some reason they call and, and I'm on the other line, please leave a message. Cause I get guys all the time that do missed calls and then they don't, they, they don't leave a message and then I, I'll see the number and I'll call them back and they're like, I didn't even leave a message. And I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to get a hold of you, make sure you got your problem taken care of, or how can I help you? Or and people are like, holy cow, like companies don't even. Well, like, they need to understand they, you're yeah. on the phone from from eight o'clock in the morning till five, yeah. and then I know you do a lot of after hour stuff, yep. but you're one guy having individual service customized yep. service for each customer so if you don't get him leave a message Please. so we can immediately get back with you but you spend virtually all of the hours of your day yeah. working directly with customers and helping them solve their their issues and problems yep. and how to make good choices and that's what you do yep that's that's in a in a nutshell. That's my job description. So guys, reach out to Cody seven zero two eight four seven eight seven four seven. That's extension two. If he doesn't answer, leave him a message. I promise you, he will call you back. Uh, make sure to mention the J Scott Outdoors podcast. Uh, he routinely takes care of the JSO listeners. Uh, th Cody, thank you for that. I also want to thank the additional sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about Kuyu, you can tune in to my Instagram story as I'm constantly answering questions about Kuyu. Uh, for more information, you can also go to KUIU.com. Uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting is the best ultralight hunting gear. I've been wearing it since the end of 2010. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. If you use the JScott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount. And also onxmaps.com, use the JScott 19 promo code, which by the way, guys, it's probably going to turn into the JScott 20 promo code because we're about to be in 2020. <laughs> it uh, is. But Onyx Maps, I use Bring every day. We've mentioned it here on this podcast, how Jared used it as an application to figure out which unit he was in. Um, and I, I use it every day, private, public land overlays, the aerials, the topos. 
uh, be able to toggle back and forth between the hybrid mode, uh, being able to uh, do a line measure distance, being able to breadcrumb your way in and out, uh, being able to import and uh, export from Google Earth back and forth. Uh, they also have a desktop application. It's awesome. Go to onxmaps.com. Use the jscott19 promo code. You're going to save 20%. Guys, again, Jared, I really appreciate your time. Cody, I appreciate your time. I want to give you a chance. If you have any final concluding thoughts, uh, go for it. You know, I just, Jay, thanks again for having us on. Jared, thank you for coming on. Um, I look forward to uh, working with Jared in the future, and this coming year is going to be a big year, you know, for Go Hunt and Vortex, and um, I'm just really excited. I mean, I, 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 the, the, the choices and all the different things that all of our vendors are bringing to the table – um, you know, and it's humbling to have the guys and the amount of people calling that are calling and we'd love to help. And, um, yeah, just thanks for uh, having us on Jay. Oh, and all I can do is echo that gohorn has been a, an excellent partner, both for me personally and for Vortex from a, from a corporate standpoint, we appreciate the, the time you give us on, on your platform here, Jay. And it's just, it's always great to a sit here and talk about product and B to gain knowledge from the two of you. And, and, uh, I hope to do it again in the near future. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, we talked about some of the shows that Go Hunt's mm -hmm. going to be at. I'll let you go ahead and reiterate that. And then also, if you're going to be at any shows, um, if you would spell yeah, that out uh, as well. I'll be at, uh, at uh, um, the Wild Sheep uh, Foundation uh, in uh, January 16th through, what, the 18th or 19th. And then um, we will also be in Salt Lake City for the Western Hunter Conservation Expo. And I believe that's the second week. I don't know the date. It's dates. the fourteenth through the yeah. 17th I was going to say yeah, it's the there. it's the second week in in uh, in uh, February, and so yeah, we'll be at both of those shows. And, and Vortex and Shot have, Show as well. I mean, yeah, we'll be around Shot Show. Shot Show's got me pretty wrapped up this year, but Vortex itself will have an excellent presence at at not only those, but uh, with NRA coming up middle of the year and and. Uh, uh, you mentioned Western Hunting Expo, right? Yep. Yep. So they'll have a massive presence there. The consumer sales team will be there to to answer questions and to make, you know, immediate solutions to problems if they exist. Awesome. Uh, and to the listeners out there, thank you for your avid support. And for those that are still hunting, uh, give it heck. And we look forward to uh, the over-the-counter deer hunts uh, running through January as well. And, and uh, if you do have success on your hunts or anything you've learned, please feel free to reach out and send me a message. Love to hear from you. Love to see your success. Guys, thanks a lot. God bless. Thank you again, Jay. Thank you, Jay.